Well, it is good to talk to you tonight, and we're just going to talk. So um, the Lord placed this message in my heart, you know, over these last couple of months because it, it all started with this mental argument that I was having in my head because someone wasn't being very kind to me. And I, and I found myself, like, arguing in my head, and every time I'd argue, I'd hear this verse right here, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3 through 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare, they are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So while I'm having my mental arguments, this is a verse in Scripture, and then Philippians 4, 8, which we'll talk about in a little while, um, that constantly guards my heart so that the foolish things that comes out in my little mind will be kept under. And tonight I pray that some of these things that the Lord's been showing me, over, especially over these last two months, um, with all of the stuff that's going on in the church, the building project and all of that, I mean, it, it's just a season. It, it feels long, and I will be so thankful when I see black on that parking lot. I'll be so thankful when walls go up in that building. Um, it, it's, it's just been a labor. But, you know, so when you get tired, that's when your flesh just kind of wants to retaliate. So I'm just speaking from the pages that I've, I've just been walking. Um, so tonight I'm going to talk about these things that we constantly have to pull down. It, it's like I am pressing this out in life and I'm pulling down my thoughts. Um, and God wants us to be able to destroy it in order to live victoriously, to live in the light of the word of God. We are going to see that uh, we must pass everything that comes into our mind through a filter that God wants us to take personal responsibility for. I've got a filter. You've got a filter. We might not know what that filter looks like yet, but every day that we get into the word of God, we'll see that God will help us to, to put this into practice. So there are four things that this scripture in 2 Corinthians 10 talks about. Paul's talking about pulling down strongholds, casting down imaginations, casting down every high thing, and bringing every thought that we have into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So pulling down stronghold. A stronghold is a fortress or a fortified place. It is a strong defense meant to keep something out as much as it's meant to keep something in, like a prison wall, right? Nobody can get in, and nobody should be getting out. But we don't want to be a prisoner in our own mind, so we don't want these types of unhealthy fortresses. But a stronghold is a fortress, and um, it's set up to do, in, in this instance, in the Word of God, is to prevent the Word of God from bringing personal breakthroughs in our lives, Right? So if there's a fortress, what, what it's being built up there for, the stronghold is to just keep you in captivity, a prisoner in your own mind. And we don't want to do that. Um, it is meant to paralyze people by bringing fear, by exaggerating situations, and feeding us debilitating lies. Many of us, if not all of us, in these last few years, especially in our nation, we have been dealing with lies. We've been dealing with fears. And, you know, the acronym FEAR, F-E-A-R, it's false evidence appearing real. You know, pastors in, like, ingrain that in my brain. And when I think of fearful thoughts, I'm like, that is false evidence that I'm looking at. And this is what these strongholds are meant to do is to just keep us behind these walls that we are so scared we can't get out of them. One example that is one of my favorite examples in the Bible, it's King David, and it comes from 1 Samuel 17. I'm not going to read it, verses 1 through 51, and tonight most of my teaching is coming from the New King James Version, so you can follow along. So I won't read you 51 verses, even though it's one of my favorite stories, and I promise you, this evening after this, if you go back and read it through these lenses, God will bless you richly with it. Um, so the enemy, so I, I'm just paraphrasing, and, and I'm just summarizing these scriptures. So the enemy was at war. The enemy, the Philistines, they were at war. And these warriors are screaming in the face of the Israelites. They are screaming destruction. We are going to annihilate you. Goliath was intimidating. The Bible says that he was like six cubits in one span. So when I look that up in translation, it can be anywhere depending on how you on how you do that measurement. He can be nine foot six inches or ten six. So that's pretty big, right? I, I'm just at my five feet seven, seven, 
right? The doctor told me that I've kind of lost a little bit. But anyhow, I'm, I still have this imagination that I'm five feet seven. But he was a lot bigger. If you take Pastor Mitch, it's like 6'3", and I think our kid's pastor, Rocky, might be an inch over. He's 6'5". Well, you got to think someone who has, you know, like will walk through that door. So David is looking, all the army, all of Israel and King Saul is looking at this giant and is looking at all, you know, these warriors. And they are filled with fear because they're barking all kinds of stuff at them. In verses 8 through 10, we see that Goliath is telling them, he said, I will defy you and your king. I will destroy you, right? So did not these people who are now the Israelites, did God not deliver them through the Red Sea? Did he not cast down every enemy that they had? But then they come against this one barking dog, a toothless dog, who is talking to them. And all of a sudden, the king runs for cover, and every man is to his home. We can't do anything with him. He's too big. But here comes this little ruddy shepherd boy the Bible calls David. He was ruddy. His complexion is like, I think that he was dirty, smelling like sheep. He probably had stuff in his hair. And here comes David. His dad sends him out to check on his brothers to see how they were doing, you know, and, and to take them some cheese. Love cheese. He <laughs> took them some food. And David goes to check on the army, and he's looking at all of the Israelites, his fellow brothers, and he's thinking, what's got them so scared? Because they're looking at him, and they're like, you know, like this Goliath, he's getting ready to destroy us, and there's no one that can stand against him. So David stands up, and he looks at them, and he's like, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Right? So we just heard from Festus, and, and I have always thought that he was making fun of Goliath, but he wasn't. What he recognized was that this uncircumcised guy had nothing on his circumcision, which equals covenant with God. Right? So he is reminded, he, David is now self-talking, this stronghold of fear, this giant that's over nine feet tall, we can agree on that. He is looking at him and he's thinking, you have nothing against what I have on the inside of me. So and then his brother, so I'll, I'll go down to verse 30 or verse 28. We can put that up behind me. So David, he's hearing all of the noise going on about him and he's ready to face this. But here comes his older brother, Eliab. And Eliab says, you know, to David, when he spoke to these men, Eliab's anger arose against David. And he said, why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheeps that you've got? It's not like you can take care of a lot. You just got a little bit. Who have you left those few sheep with um, to come down here? or in the wilderness, and I know that your pride and your insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. What a misjudgment from his brother. David came to check on him, to bring him food, and all of a sudden David's reminding them, hey, remember who you are. You are the army of the living God, and then this is what he gets from his older brother. This is what he gets. You leave these few sheeps, you know, how many times have you and I tried to step out in faith to do something, you know, because we know, hey, you know what? It might look scary out there. Let's just use COVID. It might look scary out there. <laughs> the Bible says that, you know, that, that the person says in their heart, oh, my gosh, there's a lion in the square, and I better not go out to be eaten. When I was reading that a couple of years ago, I saw, like, real clearly, oh, there's COVID out there. Let me not go outside before I die. Now, I'm not putting COVID down. It's a real virus. But our God's bigger than that. And we cannot be afraid to move out and step out in faith. So some of us had to keep feeding our families. And some of us had to keep ministering the word. So we opened up and we did what we had to do, saying, God, that no matter what comes, you are for me. Right. God's for us. So David's saying, you know, that, hey, I'm going to do this. And his brothers and his people, they're coming against him. So, you know, in verse 30, I love what he, he does. He turns away from his brother and he heads towards the king and the battle that's before him. Second Corinthians 10 verse 4 teaches us that we have weapons for warfare. These weapons are mighty. The word mighty there transcribes to dunamis power. It's like dynamic, dynamite power of almighty God on the inside of us. This power through God brings down, right? It pulls down all of the strongholds. All. That's what we're talking about. Pulling down here in the Greek paints a picture that we have the ability through God to completely dismantle and demolish, completely, utterly destroy 
everything that's a stronghold that comes against you and I. Everything. These weapons, they're not natural weapons, but they're supernatural weapons. These weapons are wielded by the spiritual man in you and I. When we recognize who we are in Christ, we can wield weapons of faith, right? Ephesians 6 verses 10 through 13 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, not our might, his might. It says, put on the whole armor of God, not a partial armor, put on this whole armor that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not, you and I do not wrestle against flesh and blood, right? But we wrestle against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, again, he says again, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And after you've done all, just stand. God didn't say that we would never go through the fire. But he does show us in scripture that when we go through the fire, he's with there with us. He's right there, right? He's never promised that we wouldn't go through trials. So notice that we have, again, the whole armor of God. He doesn't give us a partial armor, but this armor comes with a strategy that's inside of you because Holy Spirit is inside of you. So you have strategy. You have like a tactical upper hand that when you battle in the spirit that you already won. But we've got to recognize this, right? So let's look at what David did in 1 Samuel um, 17, verses 38. Um, Actually, I'll just back up just a little bit. David said to Saul, so this is verses 32. He says to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him, because of Goliath, because your servant will go and fight with these Philistines. And Saul said to David, you are not able to go against these Philistines to fight with him, for you are just a boy. You're just a youth, right? And he is a man of war since his youth. But David said to Saul, and this is a part that, that really grabs my heart. David said to Saul, he said, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took the lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it rose up against me, I caught it by its beard. And I struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine, again, he's reminding himself, he's not in covenant. This man who is not in covenant, an enemy of God, will be like one of them, like that lion and bear, seeing that he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said that the Lord who delivered me From the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And David and Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. You see, because sometimes when the battle comes, we have to remember all of the things that God did in the past to deliver us from it. Because I promise you that from the past, that's why all these memorial stones were, you know, that he said to his his children, leave this memorial that you would be reminded of me. So when we remember the things that God has delivered, us from, I promise you, beloved, there's nothing that you will ever go through that he will not come and fight your battle for you. So King Saul, at this point in the, in the story, he places his armor on David. Verse 39 tells us that David had not proved he hadn't tested this armor. In my mind, I've got this picture that when David, when Saul put his armor on David, David's like, like, this is too heavy. I can't wear it. It doesn't fit. I don't know what to do with this, right? So David proceeds to lay down Saul's armor, and he picks up what he had, right? And in the story, in in this Bible passage, it says he picked up his staff, his sling, and five stones. Maybe he had four more giants besides Goliath. I don't know what those stones are, but I think there were other giants that he had to face. Um, But he picks up all that he had, and in our estimate, a staff, a piece of wood, and a slingshot and a stone, is that a weapon? Is that a weapon that if you were in battle that you'd go to war with? When they've got like swords, they've got armors, they've got um, shields, you know, they've got headgear, they've got, you know, like footgear that comes up to here that, you know, back in the Bible when Paul talks about, if you really want a good book to read about spiritual warfare, read Dress to Kill by Rick Renner. It is an excellent book describing the battles that we have to face and how we face them. So Rick Renner, Dress to Kill. Um, but in, in this particular picture, so you're picturing all of these people in this army 
and even the king's army. But David comes back, and he's got an open-toed sandals on. And he's got his little stick. In fact, the Bible says that when Goliath saw him coming, he said, what do you come? You come to like, like, like you're chasing a dog, you know, with your little stick? And David says to him in the scripture, he said, I come to you in the name of the God, of the living God of the armies of Israel. And that is how David came in the name of God. You see, because Saul's armor was something that was carnal. You see, so many times when we have strongholds that are coming against us, we're looking to take what we've got. I don't got enough money in the bank. I don't have this kind of car. I don't have this kind of house. I don't have enough to eat. I don't have the right kind of friends. Those are your carnal things. What can those friends do for you that God can't? What could that money do for you that God can? God gave you the very breath that you have to have the money that you've got. So it all comes from him. So we're looking at what is natural to us. David said, I can't do that. But I'm going to go after the supernatural. And, you know, God did something between that sling and that stone and giant fell dead. All right. So that's the end of that story. So we want to be like David, you know, that when um, when stronghold comes, David gave no place for the stronghold to nest in his head. Right. He turned from the words and went to prepare himself for the battle. He debilitated and devastated this potential stronghold. David destroyed this stronghold from forming in his mind. When he heard his brother's jeers, he avoided the stronghold of not being prepared by the world's standards, the the weapons of a soldier. He didn't have that. He avoided the stronghold of facing this giant that taunted him by moving towards the giant in the faith, with his faith in God. He reminded himself of all the times that God had already delivered him and David moved forward. The shield of faith that we have, it is the one weapon that goes out before everything when we look at the weapons that God has given us spiritually. We got to put that shield of faith out of us and we can remove every stronghold that comes. So casting down imaginations. Imagination is a Greek word, logismas. Um, it comes, it means logic, reasonings, and reckonings or computation. It is a reasoning that is hostile towards the faith. We tend to rationalize these thoughts that comes into our mind by making a debate in our minds. We will also rationalize and justify behaviors rather than choose truth. These are well-defended lies. Like, like for example, you say, well, Anne, you just made me mad. Well, does Anne have control over my emotions? It doesn't matter what Anne says. I should have more self-control than to become angry. Remember, I told you all I've been pulling down thoughts. I've been pulling down words. Shut up, Mira. Put that under. That is not love. Shut up, Mira. Put that under. That is not gentleness. And it's, I'm not always successful, you know. A lot of times I'm just like every, I'm God, forgive me. That, that was bad. And I know, and I have to go back very quickly and repent. Okay? But King Saul in the Bible, so we have David, now we've got Saul. He's an example of someone who would not cast down his imagination. And because of this, it, des- it destroyed him. In 1 Samuel 18, 6 through 9, it shows us that Saul gave way to thought that came from his flesh. He heard the woman of the town singing David's praises. You know, Saul has killed his thousands and David has killed ten thousands. And he became so jealous. Saul rationalized their singing in his mind and he told himself, David is out to get me and my kingdom. He's out for it. And because of this, you know, um, he just went crazy. Dr. Caroline Leaf, in her, in her book, I forgot the name of it. It just ran out of my head. Um, she said 95% of all illnesses are mind-related. Okay? So 95%. I mean, she is the, the, one of the biggest names out there on studying the power of the mind and what it does to the human body in way of illnesses. 95% of the illnesses that people have, it's mind-related. Um, Saul became a madman. And the Bible says, you see, in the Old Testament, they really didn't know about the devil like we have heard about in the New Testament. So they attributed everything was coming from God and, you know, God sent a distressing spirit. They didn't look at Satan the way that we do, that we battle an enemy. Okay, so the Bible says that there was a distressing spirit sent from the Lord. That's how they they put that in the context in there. So here he becomes crazy. He's a madman. Um, James 3, verses 16 through 18 says, Where there is envy and self-seeking exists, so where envy and self-seeking exists, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, 
It's peaceable, gentle, willing to yield. I have a hard time yielding sometimes. <laughs> Full of mercy and good fruit, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So we have the ability to be peacemakers. In fact, we're called the sons and daughters for the ones who are trying to make peace in life. Saul became so fleshly, and he gave way to so much drama in his household. He tried to kill David time and time again. He went off on his very own son and daughter. In 1 Samuel 20, you know, he tried to kill his son over David. I mean, he's killing next in line for his kingdom. So he completely lost sight that, hey, I'm getting ready to lose everything. I'm even ready to kill my ear because he, you know, for me, it translated. Saul went back to a mindset that he was like back in middle school and high school. If I don't like them, you shouldn't like them either. That's a bad thought, right? He just, he went plum dumb. Um, Slander became, yeah, plum dumb. Slander became a part of his character and his heart became hardened and it became proud. He could not receive the truth and there was no humility. Guys, it's a season in life where we got to keep pride really, really low and humility really high in our lives. Because without humility, our hearts become hard and we can't hear the truth and we're stuck in our own minds with all these things about how life should be and how we should be treated and what we should be entitled to. We are not to think like the world thinks. So Saul's heart became hardened and it became proud. And he was not able to even receive when his son Jonathan reminded him, hey, dad, he's been good to you. He has been fighting battles alongside you. Dave, or Saul forgot all of that because he became so jealous, so insecure. In fact, I think in scripture, he is the most insecure example of a leader that I've ever seen and how dangerous that is. You know, um, how different would it have been if Saul had come alongside David and blessed him? Like how different, I've said this before, how different would it have been if Cain had went to Abel and say, can you show me how to please the father? How different would it have been if Saul had went alongside David and said, David, I'm proud of you, son. Thanks for being the hero of Israel. Let me promote you. Let me do, how different would it have been? But Saul's jealousy caused him to lose all of his household, his very own life. He murdered himself. All right, so if we are not careful about casting down imaginations when they come, right? Who cares what people think about you? You got to grab a hold of your 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 mental faculties because it will lead to devastation. It will lead to devastation if we don't take hold of that. All right, so casting down every high thing. A high thing in the context of this verse is something that is like an elevated structure, like um, a bulwark, a barrier, another fortress. A high thing comes to our mind because we have been attacked or we're getting ready to face something that will more than likely cause great pain because we're going to choose to do what is right. Here the scripture is teaching us that if it comes against the knowledge of God, we must cast it down. So Jesus faced the worst fate in natural in the natural world, worse than anyone had ever faced or will ever face, because Jesus headed to the cross for you and I. And for all the people that will ever to be born, for the ones who are not even born yet, he died on that cross to provide salvation to all. Mark 8, verses 31 through 33 And he, Jesus, began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders. Jesus faced rejection. That he would be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and that he would be killed and that after three days rise again. He spoke this word openly and then Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him and... uh, But when he, when Jesus had turned around, remember David turned around? You got to turn around from those words. Jesus turned around. He looked at the disciples and then saying to Peter, he rebuked him saying, get behind me, Satan. Capital S in there. Satan. For you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Right? Jesus is telling his disciples that he has to go to the cross to be killed. And we see this devoted disciple. Peter was devoted. He was. He was a devoted disciple. This devoted disciple telling him that he must not go. Jesus seems to be indignant that Peter would even try to stop him. He was angry. Do we really see Jesus like that? No. The other disciples must be thinking, 
what did Peter do to deserve to be called Satan? So was Peter wrong? Peter's thinking was based on earthly things. He just saw, right? Um, he saw Jesus feed the multitudes. He saw Jesus heal the sick, give sight to the blind. Jesus even paid Peter's taxes. Peter had no wants as long as Jesus was in the camp with him. His earthly needs were being met. See? So when your earthly needs is being met, you don't want anything to take that away from you, right? But we see that Jesus hit it spot on in verse 33 when we think of all these things that Peter thought he was probably going to lose. Jesus identifies where Peter was at, and he says in verse 33, you are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men, because these are the things that men are mindful of. So Jesus spoke. He saw Peter's heart. God knows everything. Life in Jesus will never be convenient, and it's definitely not easy. Jesus came to do God's will, and he asked the same of us if we are to live free, right, and live and have his abiding presence in our lives. There will be many things that will seek to become high in your life and my life, um, things that seeks to pull us out of God's will and his way, but we must learn to shut it down like Jesus did. Colossians 3, 2 says, set your mind on things above and not on these earthly things. Beloved, all of these things that we have, it's going to pass away. They're going to pass away, but we must choose to take the, the high road, so to speak, and follow what Jesus would do in every circumstance. So anything that seeks to be higher than the God place in our lives, we got to pull it down. We are responsible to do that. Tony's not responsible to, to make me do that. I've got to choose that I want to walk free. And here we get to the last point, bringing every thought into captivity. Our thoughts, if unchecked, will lead us to a life of hell on earth and may lead us to a place of separation from God. These thoughts are dangerous that we have. They will lead us to offense. They'll lead us to jealousy. They'll leave us living in our past, living in insecurity, depression, oppression. We will become a prisoner in our own minds. Remember what I said about that fortress, like a prison. Keep things from coming in keep things from going out. So the right kind of fortress we want to have around us is one that barricades us with the word of God, encapsulates us with the word of God. Make sense? We must learn to create a filter for our thoughts, meaning that with every thought that comes, we must learn to ask ourselves, does this measure up with how I'm supposed to fix my mind on or what I'm supposed to fix my mind on. Does it measure up with what the word says? Philippians 4 8, when my kids were little, I used to say the whatever verse, because this is one of the first verses that I try to get them to memorize. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, see, whatever, true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of a good report, if there is any virtue, and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. You see, we must bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. What did Jesus think of? He had his face set on Jerusalem and they were trying to keep him from God's way. And he said, no, 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 no. In fact, in Samaria, the Bible says that they wouldn't even receive him because they know that his face was set to complete the work that he was called to do. He had his mind set on something, so we must learn, too, to have our mind on the things of God, to pull these things and say, God, I'm going to choose to believe you and not, you know, live for the um, the approval of others. A lot of times when we are disobedient to the word, it's because we're looking to just look good in someone's eyes and be approved of them. It is the truth. It is the truth. That will cause us to sin. You know, we get involved in extra... I don't know why this is coming out. We get involved in relationships outside of marriage, sexual relationships outside of marriage, and we think, why? Because we don't want to say no to that guy or to that girl. Well, what's going to happen? Are they going to end up marrying you? You don't know. What do you have to lose if you stand up and say, hey, just respect me. Let me do what's right. You have nothing to lose but everything to gain. You see, so we want to be pure in every way to what God calls us to. That was a side note. That was not in my notes at all. Um, but we have to meditate on the things of God. So when we consider what the Apostle Paul was saying in 2 Corinthians 10, 5, taking every thought captive, we see a picture of a soldier so that we could look at it like this. We are to forcefully take 
Any thought that is not true, that is ignoble, that is unjust, that is impure, that is unlovely, that is a terrible, slanderous, gossiping report, that is not filled with virtue, thoughts that assassinate the characters of others in our minds. We take our supernatural weapon of the word of God and we force that thought to shut up. Okay, someone comes to me and they say, Dwight says, blah, blah, blah. The Bible says Dwight is beloved of God and called of God. So what am I doing with the things that I'm hearing? What am I doing with my thoughts? All right, we can take every argument of retaliation towards the words and treatment of others, everything that comes into our mind, like vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Right, we got to take those thoughts um, and treatment of others that we have in our minds and filter them by the word of God. We are to take the high road at all times, bringing our lives into the obedience of Jesus when we do this. Okay, we want to be obedient sons and daughters. John fourteen fifteen says, if you love me, you keep my commandments. But we say we love God while we're here and outside of his presence, we're doing everything that we know that is wrong. You know, we are, um, from the way that we speak to what we're drinking, what we're smoking. I mean, come on, there's young ones who are watching you. If you cause a young one to stumble, you are in sin, beloved. It might not hurt you, but me doing something might hurt Tamika if she saw me doing it. And if I've caused her to stumble, you see, and, 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 and the thing is, with, like with drinking, you know, sorry, pastor's just coming out. The thing with drinking, drinking in of itself is not wrong for you. But if you're doing it in front of someone who's had a problem with alcohol and they get back on the bottle, you're responsible. You are responsible. You have become a stumbling block. So what will you do when people ask you, would you lie and say, I don't drink? Liars are the children of the devil. What do we do? You see, there's a whole lot that we've got to think about, and we've got to bring these thoughts and these actions into captivity by the word of God. All right? But God is gracious. He is gracious, and he's loving, and he's gentle. So when we submit ourselves to God and we resist the enemy, he flees, and God will not bring condemnation to you. So let nothing that I say, it's not meant to bring condemnation, but it's meant to just bring us up in the Lord. Right? This is what we do. You and I are a reflection to each other. When we come in here, we see I'm supposed to be filled with hope, filled with love, filled with the answers that's the problems to this world. This is why the, the congregating of the, the body of Christ is so important. When we miss out on this, see, why isn't our church filled on a Wednesday night? That's why I said, hey, family. Because this is where we're reminded of who we are in Christ. It's when we see each other, when we're able to fellowship with each other, you remind me of who I'm supposed to be. I need you. Right? We need each other. Um, so Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. The biggest battle that many of us face, and I'm in this equation, also in life is in our thoughts and in our minds. There's so much that God desires to do in us and through us. We must fight the good fight of faith and keep pressing forward with eternity in our minds. We must know that we have within us an arsenal of immense, unlimited power. The very power of Almighty God is inside of you and I. It's explosive power. Um, just like David, we just take what we have. He took his staff, he took his sling and his stones. We just take ourselves and let God do the rest if we're depending on him. First Samuel 17, 46 sums it up. What David said, he said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword. You come to me with your words and your discouragement. And, and you can't give me a kind word. You can't treat me right. See, these are the weapons of the enemy. You put me down. You lie about me. You, you just insult me. You use me and abuse me. You come to me with that and with your sword and your spears. But I come to you. How would Jesus respond to the attacks that we face? I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the army of Israel, whom you have defied. So in other words, what he's saying here, when you come against me, you come against God when I'm walking in the way. And God be the judge between you and I. 
That's where we leave it and we move on. All right, so moving forward as I close, um, and then I'll turn the mic over <laughs> to the pastor so you can close up the service. Um, moving forward, there are four things that I, I felt like I just wanted to say here. Identify the lies that you hear in your mind. For every lie, find a truth in the Bible that God speaks to you. When you hear you're not smart, does God say that about you? You know, so for every lie, identify what they are and go find a truth that God speaks about you. Identify when there are moments you are more prone to mental attacks. As you learn to recognize these, find something to do that breaks the cycle. It may be that fearful thoughts come to you when you're alone. So guess what? Find a way to be around people who will encourage you in the word of God. And if you have too much idle time, find a job. Find something to do. Idle times, my papa used to say, is in the devil's workshop. All right? So idle hands. We don't want idle hands. A lot of things happen when we're idle. Um, Three is identify toxic relationships that may pull you back into what God has set you free from. Replace these relationships with people who will pull you up in life. And my fourth moving forward point, identify the Iliabs in your life. Identify those big brothers who just speak. You just got a few sheep. You ain't got much going for you. And when you identify them, ask the Lord to place friends and mentors who will help you develop your potential in Christ.